So, so Danny's going to speak for three to five minutes first, and then um, Margaret Rempel will be speaking secondly. Ms. Rempel owns and operates a mixed farm near St. Anne, Manitoba, consisting of a hog enterprise and 1,600 acres of cropland growing cereals and oil seeds. She lived for three years in northeastern Brazil and has, is active in a variety of different organizations. For instance, she's been a director of the Key Keystone Agricultural Producers. She has served on the board of the Canadian Food Grains Bank as a director, chairing the board uh, during that time and has traveled extensively during that time. Uh, she is also on the board of directors of the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute. So the, the plan is right now to ask Danny to spend three to five minutes picking up on one or two key issues and, and share those. And then Margaret will, will have three to five minutes to pick up on one or two key issues that she'd like to, to share. Uh, and then we're going to give Martin some time to respond to those points. And, and then after that, we'll, we'll go to, to all of you and, and hear your thoughts and comments. So I'm going to pass it over to Danny. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and before I begin, uh, Jerry, congratulations on this uh, wonderful series. You're doing a, a great job. And in particular, uh, congratulations on starting off with a bang with Martin. Martin, uh, that was a fabulous talk. Uh, very provocative. Uh, very hopeful as well. There's some uh, discouragement in there, but there's a lot of, of hope as well. So I congratulate you and your team for all, all that they're doing. Uh, so I, I'm not sure where to begin, but uh, let me be, let me choose to begin this way. Um, Martin, that, that that's a kind of talk where it seems to me you could substitute oil for food and have the same talk. There's there. You know, there's, a, there's hope in your talk, as I said, but there's also uh, some despair in the kinds of choices we've made over the decades on how we grow food. And as a climatologist who's obsessed with carbon dioxide and, our, and the growing abundance of it and our, the foolishness that we have, including in the, the three stooges, uh, especially the, the two local stooges, and how we persist, we persist and persist in doing the thing that we know we know the science is clear. Uh, we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't, uh, as as we shouldn't be going into biotechnology, or we shouldn't be making as many choices away from local food and and organic food as as we have. Well, so too in the energy sector, we've been making some really stupid choices, and we continue to deny that they are stupid. And uh, the solutions that are be being presented to to the the problem are are not sensible geoengineering, let's not worry about how much carbon dioxide there's going to go into the, uh, continue to go into the atmosphere. Let's fix the problem after the fact by messing with the stratosphere and, and fooling around with seeding the oceans and all these stupid, dangerous ideas, rather than getting right down to the nitty gritty, and, and that is equivalent to, to your idea, doing things on a small scale, using energy and different kinds of energy on a small scale rather than on this this large scale. So as a geographer, I have to say that there, there obviously I think is an issue of scale here. We, we deny uh, in, in the way that we operate in the economy, we deny that small is beautiful. We, we, we've known that for a long time. Small is beautiful, small works. And yet we continue to make these choices from an economic perspective and, and especially political perspective where we must grow and be as big as possible. and and. Uh, research of the sort that you and your team are doing and so many people around the world are doing show, are show clearly that that's not a sustainable. It's just not sustainable. It just can't continue to, um, the way that it is. And so, uh, there, uh, I, I, as I said, there, there's some, I see some hope in the kind of work that you're showing, you're showcasing as being sensible. I wish I could say the same thing um, more often in my uh, area. Although, uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't suppose Kurt is here. Is Kurt Hall here? No? So uh, I, I'm, I work with, uh, uh, not very much anymore actually, Climate Change Connection uh, uh, operating out of the Eco Network. Kurt Hall is one of our managers with uh, Susan Lindsay and, and others. And Kurt is, the, Kurt is the optimist guy, optimistic guy, and I'm the pessimistic guy. I'm the guy who knows the science, and Kurt is the guy who, who's on the street doing things. He, He's, uh, he 
continually reminds me of the same kinds of stories that you're showing that there are uh, that there are examples of people doing thing pro doing things properly properly sensibly on a small scale we just have to replicate that 100 million times and then things might be might be fine so there are are sensible solutions uh, to big problems out there but um, how they actually get into play in the numbers that they have to, I'm not really sure. One of the issues, and I'll, maybe I'll finish with this for the moment, one of the issues is, and you alluded to it in your report card, was that we're discounting the value of the natural world. And I would say we're also discounting the value of the future, where you know, that, that there's, there's the atmosphere has, has value, and so does the future atmosphere for our kids and their kids and their kids and their kids. And uh, somehow we have to get rid of that bad economic model, that paradigm, and switch into a model where things are properly uh, a, a priced, I suppose, from an economic point of view, and we need to rebuild the paradigm. We need to throw out some paradigms, and how the heck that's gonna happen, especially in the Western world, I'm not really sure. So uh, you say you don't know about economics, but I, I would hope you would come up with an answer <laughs> sometime soon. <laughs> Uh, so I'll finish there, and uh, we'll come back to some, uh, have some other questions for Martin in, in a while, so I'll pass it on to Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am humbly honored to, uh, to participate and to uh, be able to respond to, to Martin, whose uh, research and work in, in agriculture I have um, deeply appreciated and respected for uh, a couple of decades already. Um, on so thank you on behalf of, of farmers, and Martin, may you live long and please don't ever retire. Um, <laughs> so there's your marching orders for, for today. Um, one, of, one of the things that, that I struggle with as a, as a farmer who's been at it for, for uh, nigh on to four decades um, is, are the labels and categories. and and I, I know, Martin, you went back and forth on this a little bit as well, um, saying that, well, you don't really want too much cross-hybridization for at least one generation, so, so you can get some things going. But you did talk about swapping recipes, and, and I often feel, as a, as a primary producer, as a farmer, that I do have you know, a foot here and a foot there, and then I take a step here and a step there. And I'll, I'll just give an example. Um, my son and I farm in southeastern Manitoba. We farm heavy black clay. Uh, we are not zero-till farmers. And one of the main reasons that we aren't is that um, our area tends to deal historically with excessive moisture. So more harvests than not, this year being an exception, we end up harvesting in and leaving 12 and 16 inch deep ruts in the fields. Uh, soggy wet fields. Well, that's not a seed bed for the next crop, so we need tillage to, to close those ruts and, um, and prepare a, a decent seed bed for the next crop. That said, we do practice zero tillage in some situations. One example is we harvested canola and uh, two days later we seed it into winter wheat for, for next year. Um, there's no, no tillage involved in, in that. Um, we have on our, on our farm, we feel it's very important to integrate livestock production and crop production to utilize that complete nutrient cycle uh, that the, the manure is an incredibly valuable resource for growing the next crop. Uh, yes, it feeds the livestock, but there is also a lot of it that um, goes on to feed people as well. One example would be canola is a cash crop for us. We sell it, the oil is pressed out, it's a, healthy, it's a healthy cooking oil, a healthy eating oil, and we return the meal into some of our um, hog rations, and, and it's a, a healthy ingredient in those rations as well. So I guess I still want some permission to borrow from, from different systems, and um, each of our circumstances are unique, and somehow we have to find our way within those circumstances and um, and respect and care about about one another there is no such thing as perfection and and I often stress this there's no such thing 
as a perfect decision, a perfect choice. We all make our choices. We, we look at the pros, we look at the cons, and we try to make the best decision based on available information and, and available situ or the circumstances we find ourselves under. I'll give one quick example. As uh, a farmer who, in one of our enterprises, is raising hogs, um, and, and Martin mentioned it, that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, when really all the world was being given the, the uh, order to, you know, pull up your responsibility socks and reduce your carbon footprint. Well, as primary food producers, we took that really seriously and have, have made huge strides. We use much less fuel per acre in food production now than we used to. And, and that's uh, zero till, minimum till, low inflation tires, global positioning systems, a whole host of things have contributed to that. As hog producers, we, we worked at doing the same thing, pay very, very careful attention to nutrient requirements at all the different stages. So a pig born on our farm will have nine different uh, diets, nine different plates of food from when it's born to when it reaches market weight. In doing that, we've been able to raise a hog 20 kilos heavier than 20 years ago on 20 kilos of less feed, of less feed. That's an impressive reduction in our carbon footprint, okay? So just keep that in mind. More recently, I've got lots of voices saying, you need to raise your hogs on straw. Okay, so I have to make a decision here. To raise the hogs on straw, I have to make another pass across the field baling the straw. It has to be loaded onto trailers and transported back to the barns. Um, straw has to be put, put into the barn, and um, it's, a, it's a really good environment for a lot of bacteria and molds and parasites, so it has to be changed to, be, to work well. It has to be changed frequently. Uh, the dirty manured straw has to be windrowed uh, to, to compost it, and those windrows have to be, that compost has to be turned to, to maintain good composting. Then it has to be loaded onto manure spreaders, taken back out onto the field, uh, spread onto the land, and then it's sitting there on top of the soil. So it has to be tilled in, uh, and often, you know, another pass of a harrow to make it smooth enough for, for the seed bed for, for the next crop. Okay, so if you're counting, the tractor was started like nine more times every time using some fossil fuel. Currently, the system we use is that the waste, the, the manure, I don't like the word waste. Um, manure from the animals falls through openings in the floor. It's uh, collected in uh, lagoon, and the slurry is, is uh, injected under the surface of the soil once a year. Perfectly placed, minimal soil disturbance, just knifed in on edge like that. Soil goes right back. Um, one pass, and that's, that's it, end of story. So am I supposed to reduce my carbon footprint? Or am I supposed to raise pigs on straw? I can't do both. Now Martin might tell me how. <laughs> but <laughs> that's, those, those are the choices, those are the dilemmas that the real farmers face every day. And we have to weigh the pros, we weigh the cons, and we try to do uh, the best that we can. One of the... Um, one of the things that farmers today really struggle with is how the average citizen gets their food production information. And maybe it will change, hopefully it will change. I see lots of, of good things. Agriculture in the classroom programs are absolutely fabulous for one. But I wish that people who wanted information about hog production would ask a farmer and not Ryan Gosling. Right? He's got a well-known face, he's got lots of money, but what does he know about filing annual management manure plans and, um, and, and current manure application technologies? And what does he know about crop rotation systems and, uh, and fertility requirements and nutrient activity in the soils? I doubt that he knows very much about any of that stuff at all. But he becomes a, a spokesperson for, for uh, livestock production. I, I, I don't think I'd want him taking care of 
the animals that I'm responsible for. But that is a, that is a frustration that, that primary food producers feel. Um, a lot of information comes from, from people who, um, who have a well-known face and money and not necessarily that, that they know very much uh, about what they're talking about. One of the sadnesses of my life as a farmer in Manitoba has been the loss of, of livestock production. Um, only about 2% of the cropland in Manitoba receives any animal manure in any one year, and it's shrinking. And, um, and I see that as a sad and unsustainable um, direction to head in. Um, not that I have a lot of quick answers for that, but we can talk about mo more about that later if you like. I, I will end with just one comment that an awful lot of decisions in farming get made on the basis of money and making your payments. And for farmers who have ended up, and we can talk about a variety of reasons, with horrendous debt loads and operate on razor thin margins, they don't necessarily have options to make the decisions that would be best for the soil 50 and 100 years down the road. And, um, and that's, that's definitely a sadness and a challenge as well. Um, I'll leave it at there. Thanks very much, Martin. I, I uh, appreciate um, all you've given us this evening. Okay, th thanks for those kind words and those really interesting thoughts. Um, I'm <coughs> still thinking about Danny's question about how to be hopeful, so I'll start maybe responding a little bit to Marg's comments. You uh, have my permission to hybridize. <laughs> In fact, uh, when I was so dogmatic about the uh, ecological agriculture being separate, I, want, I was thinking more at the, um, at, at the, uh, on the government side, on the research funding side. As far as farmers go, we actually have a website called Natural Systems Agriculture. It's not an academic website. It's really there for connecting people who want to be part of this conversation. And so we have uh, our website, just Google those three words. We have a database of about 450 farmers from mostly the prairies, some from other parts of Canada and the US and other parts of the world, but mostly the prairies. And we have an annual field day at our Carmen Research Center based on ecological agriculture. And we have, we've started <coughs> having a winter meeting on this subject. And it's really been fun because um, our job there is really just to just to try to figure out what are the topics that farmers like Marg and others might be interested in exploring and then bringing in farmers to, to share their stories and bringing in some scientists or students to help maybe just fill out a little bit the uh, information. And, and you know, people like, uh, like Danny Blair are very important because there's always questions about weather patterns, you know, what is going on. And so this is, this is, Im really important uh, and, and really make it an open source system. So uh, I, I just am very concerned on the research funding side that this ecological thing be given a chance because uh, governments are very quick to uh, pull back from that. And, uh, you know, yeah. Canadian farmers, they, they are, I, I'm not, not, not trying to make farmers feel good, but they are amazing good farmers. Uh, they come from a culture that's different than every other country, including the United States. If we look at our manure management plans in Manitoba, it's stellar. Uh, you know, people around the world can't believe what we've done to manage our manure properly. Uh, you know, hog farmers are not the reason that Lake Winnipeg has got its phosphorus problems. Uh, only 6% of the phosphorus applied to land comes from manure. The rest comes from fertilizer. Um, uh, you just look at the 49th parallel and you will see that Manitoba farmers have better crop rotations uh, than American farmers, and it's because of policy. We, we, our farmers are more entrepreneurial. They have less support from government, and uh, they are better farmers. Um, sorry if there's any non-Canadians here. Um, 
And you can even see it in the industry associations. Uh, there, some of the, the pesticide, it was a little hard on pesticide companies, uh, but you know, the pesticide company industry associations in Canada, there's a completely different tone to their, uh, to their message than the Americans, for example. Like it's because of our culture in Canada. We're so lucky to be in this country where we do embrace diversity, and, uh, and they've, they've done wonderful things in this country. In terms of educating people about how we farm, oh my goodness, you know, uh, that's a big one. I, I guess, you know, one of the, the things that really helps people uh, get interested is to get involved. Actually get their hand, roll up their sleeves and get their hands ready. And the problem with just going into classes and saying a farmer does this, you know, that's great, that's a good start. We also have to get, get people a chance to be on farms and to be, you know, and, and that's, that's a fault of the education system. We need, in Europe, any ag student, they'd spend at least six months on a farm. We don't have that requirement. Our faculty has failed agriculture. We haven't done that. Danny, I still don't have a lot of, I, 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 I'm going to turn now just my final 30 seconds here. You know, the hopeful message, I think this is why I've been pu pushing Chris Turner, because the geography of hope and his, he, you know, he is in the popular discourse and he is giving examples of hope and trying to motivate people. And I, I guess the way politics works is if you get enough people behind an idea, the politicians will start listening and maybe make some changes. Um, so I guess we have to work on both ends of the spectrum. We have to get people interested uh, and we have to get politicians interested. I'm gonna tell a story from our own home and it doesn't, it's not because I wanna make us look good, but uh, when we bought our, our, our home in 1996, we had the garburetor taken out right away. Uh, and, and my point here is that we were educated enough to know that putting all those nutrients down the sink was not good for Lake Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a, we had a responsibility there. Uh, we're not gonna, get, so the, the, the plumber came, or the electrician, whatever it was, and came, took it out and said, what are you doing? And then I explained it, and, 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 and I think people, we have a very well-educated population. We need to motivate them to use their intelligence uh, for sustaining the planet. Right, so um, we're just going to now switch over to a uh, full conversation, but before we do so, I wonder if you could just join me in thanking our three speakers. <laughs> so it, it seems that Martin and, and Danny and Margaret have um, already entered into so many complex issues. Um, we, we've, you know, we're looking at science and technology, we're looking at economic issues, we're looking at um, uh, climate change issues. There's so many different issues here that have been raised. And I think um, Danny and, and Margaret have, have come with some really good points to, to get us to start thinking. So can I now ask all of you to, um, to come forward, there's uh, microphones um, at the, the base of, of both aisles. And um, come forward and, and uh, share your thoughts, uh, your questions for Martin, Danny, uh, and or Margaret uh, about this topic. We, we really want you to, to feel comfortable and um, engage in this topic. And so yeah, why, why don't you come and um, um, ask some questions of our, um, or share some comments with our, our speakers. And if you want to raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone up to you. <laughs> Do you want to just come on down? Yeah, please. One brave person, thank you. And, and if others want to just come and, and line up, that'd be great. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I guess my question is more directed to Danny and Martin. You said that when Mr. Martin was talking that you could interchange the word food with oil. And now my question for you is, having the amount of experience behind you and based on another thing that, Dan, um, that Martin said, is that if you get enough people behind an idea, maybe the politicians will listen. Mm -hmm. So my question is, based on your experience seeing, and your research, seeing all the evidence that you have and all the facts and all the resources that you have available to know what you can and cannot do, what do you think will work on a small scale that we might be able to replicate 
larger later on. Uh, thank you. So, uh, so indeed, what I, I said was that we could substitute, uh, actually, I meant energy for food, right? How we get our energy as to how we get our food. There seems to be some really uh, bad choices out there. And there are lots of examples where uh, on a small scale we, can, we should be creating, you know, looking more uh, locally. I think you called it uh, locally embedded agroecology or something like that. Well, well, so too with energy. We should be thinking more of, uh, locally about where we get our energy and where we spend our energy. Uh, uh, we have to think about conservation in, in the same way that Martin was not putting his, uh, his organics down the, down the pipe. We need to, to not waste energy in the way that we do. And we're all guilty of it because it's so embedded in our culture to waste energy, to be lazy, to, uh, to, to not think. Uh, uh, think it through what, what it is that we're doing when we're doing it, when we're driving and when we're flying and, and when we're buying, uh, especially, uh, or at least uh, interestingly, you know, con consumption is a, is a huge problem here. You know, we don't, the, the things that we spoil ourselves with are just uh, ridiculous, and I'm guilty of this myself. You know, um, I like my electronics and, and all that, but, uh, and it's so hard to give that up. But from an energy from an energy point of view, there we need to think more more locally about our, our houses, uh, and and we need uh, incentives. Uh, it would seem uh, there's one of the things that isn't happening as much as it, it should across Canada as a whole, and certainly in North America as a whole, is truly 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 investing in, in conservation, uh, so, so that we don't waste so much, so that we don't have to burn so much, that we so that we don't have to dig so much. You know, I'll. I'll tell a little story. This morning, I, uh, most of the day I was at the University of Manitoba, where Martin's from, I was judging as the associate dean or whatever I am, or whatever why I was there. Uh, I was judging, well, I guess it's because I'm an alum of the geography department at the U of M, and they were having a homecoming for the 10th anniversary of the Clayton Riddell uh, faculty out there. And so they're having a, they had a, a, a poster competition this morning, and it was from the, so there were 20 posters, 18 posters, P uh, PhDs, masters, and undergrads. And uh, much to my dismay, but I didn't let on, a whole bunch of them were about oil exploration, were about the tar sands. There was a really bright young man who, who had spent his summer showing how, where we could get more tar sands. And he was showing me soil porosity and all this stuff. And inside, I wanted to say, stop doing this science. We don't need to do this because we need to get away from that from that oil. We need to get away from, from feeling that we need that oil. But um, he, he did a, a very good job with the science. But on the other hand, there, uh, uh, being a bit more hopeful and, and talking about scale, there was a, a young man from Sri Lanka who did a, had a poster. His master's thesis was on how a large scale shrimp farming was the bad way to go in, in Sri Lanka and in fact, in the 1980s, I think, there were four corporations doing all the shrimp farming, and now there's 600 small-scale farms that have, have replaced it because the big ones didn't work because they used pesticides, and it killed everything off, so they started from scratch, or rather organically, community-based point of view, they gradually got organized and realized that it's better to work on a small scale together rather than on a big corporate scale. And that's where we are right now in, uh, food, I think, too much, and certainly in energy too much. And we need to think more about our neighborhoods rather than our corporations and our politicians driving, continually driving that, that uh, process of bigger, bigger than better. So there are, there are lots of examples, uh, of, uh, especially around the world, not so much, but growing, growing uh, more and more in North America about how you can, you can uh, feed yourself locally and you can also energy, uh, find your own energy, use your own energy, um, generate your own energy. And so uh, there's, there's hope out there. I just have trouble seeing it sometimes, especially if you read the papers or watch the news. So I don't know if that answered all of your question. Maybe Martin has something else to say there. Do you want to contribute? Just when, when we're talking about wastefulness, um, it doesn't, we're not just wasteful with our energy, we're wasteful with our food too. And yeah. I think the most recent stats from the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization out of the UN 
we're saying that our, our food wastage footprint is like 30%, which was, mm -hmm. was very alarming to me. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, that's, that's a slap in the face to primary producers, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I know that, that we, we end up wasting something too, like no, there, there is no perfection, I agree with that, but um, that's, a, that's a nasty statistic that, that we as a, as a human race need to cope with. I, I do have one comment, and that's uh, the, uh, the one thing that can, be s that can be replicated is, well, there's many things that can be replicated, small energy, very important. Um, Wendell Berry says gardening is really important. And maybe if you don't like gardening, maybe you can support somebody who gardens. Gardening teaches us something about limits. And what's interesting is a gardener will have more patience for what a farmer might ha have to do to survive because they've actually been there. They've fought the weather and whatever. But um, uh, when it comes to gardens, one really hopeful story for me is, is young mothers. Uh, the gardens have exploded in the U.S. in the last five years, and it's young mothers who are starting to grow their own food because they have questions about the safety of the food that they're getting. And um, you, you, you might have a cell phone. Uh, maybe we could have an app, uh, you know, where you could share recipes with people around the world, people your generation. You could share stories about, you know, grow one thing, grow kale. I mean, nobody knows what to do with kale, but everybody can grow it. So, you know, <laughs> and then have a joke about, you know, you composted everything you grew. But um, it actually focuses our attention on something that we can do that teaches us about limits, that, that puts us into community with farmers, and that puts us into community with other people around the world. Because I think young people are interested in food and food justice. And, uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's something that we can focus on. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have other questions? Yes, I, please. Hi, uh, I just wanted to start off by saying I've been really energized by the talk tonight and thank you all for your um, amazing contributions to this subject. Uh, my name is Caitlin, I'm part of the Masters in Development Practice program um, here at the University of Winnipeg. Uh, and we focus on indigenous development uh, in our program. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, as we kind of progress into this, uh, into this year, I'm a first year in the program, um, we're seeing more and more that Indigenous voices, uh, despite being leaders in defending biodiversity and uh, in living within the planetary means uh, in a good way for generations upon generations, um, we're realizing more and more that those voices are, are absent from these conversations and absent from the table. So I'm wondering um, what you folks as leaders in this field are kind of doing to ensure that those voices are heard and present uh, in a meaningful way, or if you are, <laughs> and, uh, and how we can kind of keep moving forward in ensuring that that is happening more and more in talking about food justice and, and sustainability in farming. Yeah, thank you so much for raising that. Um, I, I completely agree that Aboriginal voices, what Aboriginal voices tell me, because I have read and I have studied and I have talked to elders, is that we, we need to live within our limits. And I um, believe that uh, they will guide us in the future. Um, and we need to empower people who are in touch with the creation in ways that we cannot even imagine. I really, truly believe that. I did a, a short sabbatical uh, at CMU, actually, and, uh, and did some discussing of, of, you know, and I learned a lot, and, and I'm just scratching the surface. I also um, used to live next to the Long Plains Reserve in Western Manitoba and working with communities, and I think that's what makes me, motivates me to say things and think things that aren't popular in, in my community uh, because I, I know how deeply people feel about the land and thank you for that gift. I'll, I'll, ju I'll just say this, so, um, I'm not so connected to that community as maybe I used to be. Uh, as I, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm co-chair of the steering committee of the Climate Change Connection, in, it, which is Manitoba's principal outreach community for climate change. And, and 
it of course overlaps a lot with agriculture and, and farming and transportation and, and, and indigenous viewpoints and indigenous lives. And so I really enjoyed my time uh, working with SEER, for example, the Centre for Indigenous Environmental Resources. They were, uh, they were and still are very active in the community. And we, had, we actually have on the books at the university here, we just need some money from the provincial government to get it going, uh, a program which we designed uh, a couple years ago, or we got it through Senate. It's, called, uh, it's a BSc program in environmental studies called Science, Environment, and Indigenous Knowledge, SEEK. And it's just sitting on the books waiting for us to, to implement at the university, a very unique program whereby uh, people of, of all sorts, but especially targeted at indigenous communities, come to our, com our community and learn about Western science, if you will, and also uh, learn about and share uh, indigenous knowledge about food and, and climate and, and such. And uh, we're hoping to get that really going in the next year or so if some money comes forward. And what, what might get that going is, I'll show you this with you. Um, so M Martin, you're, I'm sure you're aware of uh, Ian Morrow's work, uh, who did the Seeds of Change video uh, several years ago. He's becoming a member of our geography department in January. Uh, we stole him away from Mount Allison University. He's a Canada <laughs> Research Chair, and it's a long story, but he is becoming a prof in our geography department in January. And we're really excited about that for a lot of different reasons. He's a really interesting guy. Food security in the north, climate change in the north, indigenous viewpoints, indigenous knowledge, uh, filmmaking. He's, uh, he's a cool guy. <laughs> and so we're hoping that that will uh, uh, kickstart a lot of uh, indigenous-based uh, or con uh, concerns uh, in the near future. So watch for that January 1st. <laughs> 2014. Can, can, can I just add quickly that Nettie Weeb's uh, presentation here in this series will be interesting to all of us, is, and, and including you, because she has had interaction with indigenous communities in other parts of the world. And I just, you know, was thinking, yeah, you know, in terms of the agriculture, uh, European agriculture indigenous interface, it's been much, uh, I, 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 I told you our history, you know, we just sort of nipped it in the bud, um, which was disastrous. Uh, absolutely, you know, I asked Sarah Carter, what would have happened if the Canadian government wouldn't have done that? She said, well, I'm a historian, I don't, I don't predict the future, I just, you know, write history and think about it, and, uh, and that's fair. But uh, other places in the world, Central America, South America, there's a, a much, uh, much to learn, and, and it would be wonderful, uh, Africa, of course, uh, Asia, it would be really, and it's probably already happening to have Aboriginal uh, students and leaders and elders uh, interact with those communities in those parts of the world and learn how you get a voice at the table when it comes to ag policy. Because, you know, I'll say it again, um, it, we have overshot the ecological cap capacity of this planet in 1980. Uh, we need to do a 180. Um, and I think uh, Aboriginal voices are a big part of that. Good, you know, anything we can do to help. And Martin, when you said the words agricultural policy, I think that that has been a huge frustration uh, from from both sides of, of the coin, whether it's from the indigenous community or non-indigenous community here. And and even though Martin says, you know, we tried to nip it agriculture in indigenous communities in the bud in the late 1800s, there were still native communities being fabulous farmers, when the Canadian Wheat Board was created and every farmer had to have a permit book, then suddenly native farmers were not allowed to have a permit book, just like they weren't allowed to have a title to their house, right? Those kinds of things are incredibly frustrating and um, yeah, and we all have to keep chipping away at that really bad policy that, that exists, um, including in agriculture in terms of Okay, thank you very much. I think there's another question. My name is Eldon Brawl. I work with the Canadian Food Grains Bank, and this is a very, very important topic that uh, um, I think our organization is, is dealing with every day. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers uh, for Martin and uh, Margaret um, and Danny as well for your input into this. Uh, there was something that really struck me uh, in Martin's presentation, which uh, 
forced me to look at things a little bit differently, this relationship between economics and the environment. Um, I think that this is one of the major challenges that we have, uh, and this tension is always there. Um, it's not only here in Canada or North America we have this tension, but it's also a tension that smallholder farmers have. Uh, they probably don't call it economics or ecology, ecosphere. They probably simply call it feeding their family. Um, and the expense they sometimes have um, or is necessary on the environment to feed their family. Um, I think that uh, how we address this tension between the economic challenge and the environmental challenge is really going to shape this discussion in the future. And uh, I think we're all prone to uh, short-term thinking for short-term gain. Uh, I'm wondering if we need to retool economics somewhat. Uh, I think the, the smallholder farmer example, and Martin gave a, a number of examples of that, how um, they have been able to, um, in some ways, uh, grow food sustainably uh, and economically. In fact, it was more economical uh, when they used, uh, in the instance of Roland, the example of Roland Bunch, used green manure cover crops to um, produce nitrogen rather than buying fertilizer. And I think that is, uh, I think they're forced into that situation because they live so intimately close to the land. And for many of us, we live so far uh, from the environment that, we, that sustains us each and every day. So I think there needs to be some creative solutions around that, uh, how we link a little bit more closer to the environment. And I think policy definitely comes into that. Um, I, I would be interested in, in hearing uh, some of your comments on, on how we can make that link a little bit stronger rather than keeping it uh, almost as a economics versus the environment. Does anybody want to? Uh, uh, maybe I'll jump in um, unless somebody else is ready to go. go. Okay. Um, you know, the, the uh, discipline of ecological economics, uh, just to explain, I, I think it is uh, a help. And um, uh, the way the way I've read it is, is you've, you know, we had microeconomics and everybody understands microeconomics and macroeconomics was a new economic order that was uh, implemented after the Great Depression of the 1930s, the stock market crash. And so we had, you know, we had uh, global structures in place to manage the flows of money so we didn't have too many massive collapses. And so really for economists, it should be quite simple to transition to ecological economics because uh, they change the market once from micro to macro, we can change it again. So the, the, uh, the environmental ec economists still want to use the market, but they want to change the market. So, and there's other people here that could probably say much more about it than I can. Um, yeah, one of the things, uh, my, the only other thing I have, you know, uh, thinking about in this regard is um, I, 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 business is important. Uh, people need incomes. And uh, the ecological approach in smallholder agriculture, David Norman, who's done a lot of work on development, he said some, some smallholder farmers are getting so small, even the best ecological practice is not allowing uh, a livelihood. And so they're, they're adopting the term a livelihoods approach. So it's, it's a, a blended life where you, you, know, you do some food production sustainably, some income from somewhere else. We see that on Canadian farms all the time. Um, but, uh, and the connection between the ecosphere and uh, nature, that's why I gave Elmwood High School the shout out because they actually, those kids probably think about if the wind is blowing that day. Mm -hmm. And that's a start. And they have a garden too. <laughs> Margaret or Danny, would you like to share? I, I want to emphasize the garden thing. When I was a kid growing up, all of my peers, and many of them were not, I mean, I grew up on a mixed dairy farm, but many of, of the kids I went to school with were urban kids, but they all, virtually all, I probably say 95% had backyard gardens. My generation, very few have backyard gardens. Now, Martin's telling me that the next generation, my kids' generation, is, are growing gardens again. 
and uh, and that that gives me hope. Um, but it's driven in in great part by by economics. And I'll give you an example related to the Food Grains Bank. Going back a few years ago, um, many communities have community um, growing projects to raise money for the Food Grains Bank. So in our project, I thought, well, I'll, um, I'll plant a few more rows of, of sweet corn, and when it comes time for our, our wheat harvest, I'll bring the truckload of sweet corn out there, and it'll be another income. So fine. Um, I, I grew sweet corn, bagged it, sold it, you know, eight cobs in a bag and um, raised just under an extra $400 for, for the food grains bank. Well, at the same time, I'm doing some contracts with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. All I need to do is to accept about another six or seven hours of work and I could have contributed more to the food grains bank by giving that donation, right? Rather than doing all the soil prep, the seeding, the weeding, caring for the plants. I mean, put hours into, into that for that. So, so much is driven by money. I mean, my generation, why would I plant a garden? I'll work one more hour and I can, I can buy enough food for a week. So, th that's dictated it a lot. Well, let me, let me take this tack. So, um, Margaret has pointed out that terrible statistic that an enormous amount of food especially in North America, goes to waste. Does that mean that food is too cheap? Is it because it's not priced properly? And hopefully that would, if the prices were to go up, it would go back to, to the, the, the producers. In the same way that I, I've always said that gas is too cheap, that f uh, fossil fuels are, are way too cheap, which is why we abuse it and use it. And, and uh, so it, it's a, how, however it happens, I, I, I'm, I'm, neither am I an ec economist, but it seems to me that the price of things is just out of order of their cost to the, the, to the natural world and to the effort that, and to the value of it, the importance of it, both from an energy point of view and from a food point of view. Mm. So I don't know how. In 1960, my father was getting $1 a bushel for wheat. If the price of wheat had increased, just according to the cost of production, not cost of inputs and all of those other things. Wheat should be $60 a bushel today. Oh. It's six if you're lucky. <laughs> one uh, one uh, paradox that I want to share with people just before we go is uh, there's, a, there's a book that Wes Jackson told me about. It's called The Coal Question, written by Stanley, William Stanley Jevons in 1865. 1865, Stanley Jevons. Uh, was wondering uh, why coal consumption was going up when steam engines were becoming more efficient and for a given amount of work it required less coal. Um, what he learned uh, was that the efficiency of the engines was freeing up capital and that capital was going hunting around for more coal to burn because our economy is essentially run by fossil fuels. The market did not create the wonder of our economy over 200 years, it's been fossil fuels. And so this is called Jevons Paradox, uh, J-E-V-O-N-S, it's a great essay topic. Uh, you just w download it from Wikipedia. Um, away you go, take the night off. <laughs> Jevons Paradox, and I think it, it tells us about the efficiency trap, the, the, the $6 wheat, it, uh, as we become more efficient, um, and we're always told to become more efficient, and nobody is told that more often than farmers. And they, they become more efficient, and consumption goes up because, uh, so that's why I really think that if we want to do the, r the right thing with the ecosphere is we need to put a cap on what we do. We need to, you know, uh, our mothers told us this, we can't spend money we don't have. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much for, for the questions and, and for the responses. And, and I think we should, uh, at this point, wrap it up. We have um, just, uh, I'd just like to thank our, our speaker and our respondents once again. If, if you could just once again join me. And, and
And, and I just, uh, I hope that you can join us in the lobby in, in two minutes. There's some food and, and I hope our, our guests can hang around and maybe answer some questions. There's also some wonderful um, faculty members here from Menno Simons College. And if I can just identify Kirit Patel and Jonathan Sears and Kenton Lobey. Have I missed others? I, I'm sorry if I've missed anyone. Please, if you get a chance to talk to one of them. Uh, Kirit's involved in a major research project looking at um, millet in, in rural India. Kenton Lobey's involved with the CMU farm that uh, John Sears likes to eat, <laughs> absolutely, and does some, some fascinating research on the politics of democracy in, in Mali. So um, please um, uh, take some time and, and mingle if you have, uh, have the time. And, and I just wanted to remind folks that, um, now, I, I really was enriched by this presentation and the respondents, I hope you were too, but they raised so many questions, both the, the questioners and, and our speakers. And, and the purpose of this series is to look at some of those other issues that have been raised. So economics certainly has come out in, in, in some of these points. Haroon Akram Lodi will be speaking in November, and, and he's going to look sort of at the political economy of food and farming. So please come in November. Our speakers in the winter also will have a lot of awesome things to share. Uh, the question about indigenous participation in, in farming. The speaker next um, in, in October is Shirley Thompson from the Natural Resource Institute at the, at the U of M. And she's going to be looking at the harvest of hope and food sovereignty in northern Manitoba. And um, we have uh, our respondents are Shayla Shukla, who's from the Indigenous Studies Department here at the U of W, and Wab Kanu, who's the Director of Indigenous Inclusion um, at the University of Winnipeg. So thank you once again for coming. And uh, just please uh, hope you can take some time to mingle and enjoy the food. So, oh, and, and one final thing I should mention for those of you who are students or who think, are thinking of becoming students, uh, we have these three courses being offered in the winter term. And two of them are offered here at Mano Simons College at the University of Winnipeg, and one's being offered at CMU Shaftesbury campus. And uh, again, if you wanted to speak to one of the faculty members, we could tell you more information about that. Anything else I should mention? We're good? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.